Hello, hello everybody. How you doing? Thank you so very much for joining us. This is going to be a great night tonight. We have um, one of my former colleagues. He's going to co-host for me tonight, um, Mr. Don Fryerson. But what I wanted to do tonight is um, we're going to talk about the life and the, and the legacy of Dr. King. We're going to show you some pictures. We're going to show you some marches. We're going to show you when um, during his assassination. And we're going to find out. I got the scholar on here with me because I don't know it all. And you're welcome to ask questions, whatever questions you want to ask pertaining to um, Dr. King's life. We encourage you. And I got something wrong right here. I know what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm doing. Now, let me see. How can I do that? Yeah, there we go. There we go. That's it right there. Get your questions right. And we will be more than happy to um, answer your questions and comment on your questions. But let us say hello to you, Miss Dina Brown. How you doing, darling? Uh, Katina McCoy, how are you? Thank you for joining us. Gary Cash, how you doing? Now, how do I pronounce this name right here? Um, oh, that's Keith Hugh, Hughes. Uh, Hughes is, I think. How you doing? And 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 Annie Norris. Let's say Miss Kennedy, my friend Devante Jeffco, Miss Tarver, Miss Loretta Beasley, Minister Bobby Bridges, Susie Noble. Welcome, everyone. And I will speak to you as always once you come in. We say, Welcome, Don Fryson. Hey, how you doing? Fine, hold that head up high and get that position right where we can see that face. I have to keep my mask on because I have a uh, autoimmune huh? disease. I said I have to keep my mask on because I have an autoimmune disease and the people in the building. So, okay, as long as you it. look up now. Okay, I'm. We, I, was we still... read, I was trying to read something to make sure um, I could answer any questions. That you well, have. we'll wait on you. We'll wait on you. Well, I'm ready. I am ready. You know, what we're going to do is um, tell us, um, what do you remember? Where were you at? What were you doing? Now, I got to put it back this way because I can see your face. That's uh -huh. right. Where were you? What were you doing when you received the news about um, Dr. King assassination? You know, I believe I was home when i received that news and i don't remember my thoughts are what that evening were but i can remember what it was like going to school the next day and mm -hmm. how tense things were and how difficult um it was because i was going to an integrated school at the time Eau Claire high school which was integrated and didn't have a lot of black students of course it's predominantly black now but back then it was not and so, um, no, I'm sorry, I was at C.A. Johnson. My brother was at Eau Claire High School. But I remember um, distinctly this. I forgot what class it was, but there was a young lady in our class, and I could see her face today saying she was afraid. She was really afraid, and she was really scared. And, you know, you just felt that it was just going to come to an end because if nonviolence could not uh, be persuasive to a certain people, then what else was left? It was uh, it was a tumultuous time. And you got to remember uh, doing that same thing months later. I think uh, no, we lost Robert Kennedy later, about a month or two later. But um, you know, it was just. Uh, I want to say an interesting time, but it was a frightening time, too. Did you feel like the world come to, had came to an end? Yeah, you know, 1968, uh, there was a book written by William Manchester. And he described 1968 as the year all hell broke loose. 
because not only did you have the assassination of Martin Luther King, you had the assassination of Robert Kennedy, you had the uh, Democratic Convention in Chicago where police were literally beating people in the street. It was just a, um, it was just a, I don't know, a hellifying year. And when Martin Luther King was killed, you just got the impression, at least I did, that okay, hey, it's over. You know, it's nonviolence is not going to work, so we might as well move to some other phase. Did you ever attend any of his marches? And you all, the audience, you're welcome to chime in and let us know some of the experiences you may have had with Dr. King. And then uh, where were you at when you heard of his assassination? You know, I never attended any of his marches. I don't know how many marches he actually held in Columbia, South Carolina. I do know that he uh, came to South Carolina many times, a lot of times down on Penn Center, down in Beaufort which was like a retreat for him. There's also a clip on YouTube where he spoke in King Street, South Carolina. But I don't know how many times he actually came to Columbia. What I was told was that at the time he was assassinated, he was planning a trip to Columbia, South Carolina. I know he did go to Charleston, South Carolina on um, several occasions. And um, there's an interesting story about him coming to Charleston. If I have time, I'll tell you about it. It just goes to show what people thought of him at that particular time. Um, how old was he when he, I know he'll be 94 on my, on Sunday, but how old was he when he was assassinated? I think he was 38, I was 39, somewhere mm -hmm. around 38 to 39 years old. Mm -hmm. yeah. Listening to the speech that he made that night, um, do you think he knew that his time was up? Uh, you could um, actually get that impression when he says, I've been to a mountaintop. I don't care what happens to me now. But the thing I think most people don't do is go back and play the entire speech from the time he got up to that lecture to the time he finished and what he was saying. I played a speech by Malcolm X this past Monday called A Ballot or a Bullet. And basically Malcolm X was talking about a brand of black nationalism and that we need to be doing this. We shouldn't be waiting on anybody to do this. And, and, and if you listen to what King was saying in that last speech, he was coming close to Malcolm. But what a lot of people do is when they talk about King, they talk about his I Have a Dream speech, which was given in 1963. But King had moved away from that position. As a matter of fact, if you read some of his speeches after that, you would think that he's probably, he had probably given up on America. But if you listen to his mountaintop speech to from beginning to end, it closely approximates what Malcolm was talking, because King was talking about, hey, you know, we need to just... Uh, these people don't want to serve us. They don't want to do right by us. Well, you know, we need to um, stop going to their stores. We need to um, do our own thing. And I just hate it when people talk about King. They can't get past 1963 and uh, his message of, uh, I have a dream. Which, by the way, was not, the first time he gave that speech was not at the Washington at the Lincoln Memorial. He had given it before. Where and did he I, give it before at? The first time I ever heard of that speech was at Cobo Hall in Detroit, which was, I think, about a year earlier. Now, he may have given it before then, but I'm almost certain he gave it uh, a year earlier at Cobo Hall. And the interesting thing about the speech at the Lincoln Memorial at the March on Washington, that was not a part of his speech that day. It was not a part of what he was going to say. And the interesting thing about that is, Jim Clyburn told me about this. Oh, about 1988. And, you know, I didn't believe him, you know, because I had never heard that before. But basically what happened was, and this is what Jim Clyburn told me, Congressman Clyburn, King was speaking. And King could be eloquent. And sometimes he could be so eloquent 
that sometimes his speeches would like go over your head. He was talking about nullification and all this, and the cr crowd wasn't really feeling that. Mahalia Jackson, who was standing right behind him, said, tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. And that's when, in a sort of a riff, he went on to the I have a dream thing, which is a speech he'd been given, which he'd given before. And uh, Congressman Cliven told me that many years ago, and I thought he was joking, but he was actually telling the truth. Don, do you think Dr. King would be disappointed today with the direction that we're going in? I think he would be disappointed on a certain level in some things. I think on others, he would be proud. I think um, the way young kids are engaging the movement and getting involved through Black Lives Matter, I think he would be proud of that. But you know, Loretta, it's interesting Last week on the urban scene, uh, we talked to Mika as Devine and I talked about this fact. Vote, voter turnout was the lowest in South Carolina than it has been in a generation. Think about that. The voter turnout in South Carolina was the lowest that it's been in over 20 or 30 years. But who fought is that, Don? It's our fault. It's uh, our fault because we have people that sacrifice for us, but we won't get out and vote. And you know, the thing about it is, Loretta, people will say, well, I don't want to hear that talking about people sacrifice for us and all that stuff. Now, you ask me, had I ever been in a march by uh, Dr. King? No, I have not. But I have been in marches. And basically, the marches that I've been in, they've been peaceful and calm. You know, sled comes out. They know where you're going to march. And we have... We used to have black sled agents there. I mean, you wouldn't have to worry about getting shot at anything until I was on a march in Forsyth County, Georgia. And that's where, um, mm -hmm. oh, I forgot what happened. I think somebody had gone to a civil, had, something happened when a black man was running out of it. And so the next week, they had this big march in Forsyth. I, it was so many buses there. You literally couldn't get into the town. But when we got into, because our bus got there early, I'll never forget this. We got off the buses. Kevin Gray and I were acting as marshals. And right across from where we were standing, there were people dressed up in Ku Klux Klan garb, um, little kids. They were like telling us, well, um, and I'm, I'm going to be candid here. Nigga, go home. Nigga, you need to be marching to the uh welfare line instead of the courthouse and nigga this and you could hear them i mean they were but they were like maybe 150 feet uh from us in a, a pen sort of they couldn't get to us but you could hear and then you you see that and you think about what those marches marches had to go through back during the 60s when well, they didn't have the protection we had no they didn't have protection uh-huh but, but they were but they wasn't afraid no, um, but they were marching because they saw that as a way to protest the discrimination that African Americans were experiencing. The other thing about that is I was at a march in Strom Thurmond High School, and back during the civil rights era, most of those marches came from the church. I mean, you were like meet at the church and then mm -hmm. march. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I never could understand that, although I know the church is very important in our community, until we were at Strom Thurmond, the Strom Thurmond building, Jesse Jackson was there and all that, and they put on something by Al Green, the law would make a way somehow, and man, we were standing out there, Loretta, listening to Al Green. And I mean, the music was piped up. The law will make a way. You know, you know. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It was like you could march through Strong Thurman instead of march because the mu the music and the atmosphere just pumped you up. So the church served as a fulcrum to get people charged up. You know, people in the church saying, okay, we're going to go out here and march. Um, Gary said, it's the black people fault. We fault. We, 
act as we we act as we like we're scared to vote in South Carolina. I'm from South Carolina. It's horrible the way a lot of blacks think, especially about the elections. Well, you know, one of the reasons they cite it is because they say that the Democratic Party takes advantage of black people and the Republican Party don't do anything for us. Now, Loretta, you know, you and I have been knowing each other for years. And one thing I know about you is you aren't going to let anybody take advantage of you. No. I mean, I've, I've seen that now. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's not going to happen is because you're going to get engaged and you're going to let people know how you feel. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've done that to me, although sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what I'm saying, nobody can take advantage of you if you don't let them. So instead of complaining about one party taking advantage of us, we need to get engaged. We need to support candidates through contributions of our money. We need to go to these meetings. We need to go to these hearings. We have to stay engaged. And, you know, I'm not here offering a uh, political thing, but, you know, if you look at what the other party is doing, especially what happened last week, I mean, what happened last week? Well, you know, with uh, 15 votes, it took McCarthy to uh, oh, get yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. what they say they're going to do, like cutting Social Security and all this other stuff. Um, you know, we have to stay engaged and we have to get involved politically because there's just too much going on that's going to affect us. That's why Dr. King, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, had as a fulcrum. Look, you got to get registered to vote. You got to stay involved. I think um, somebody agreed with me. Um, I think it was um, Gary Cash. Me, I think very, I think Valvita that Dr. King would be very disappointed. Because we, number one, we don't stick together. We fight against one another. Sometimes we are our own worst enemies. Sometimes it's not the other color. Sometimes we fight against each other. Don, you said that I will say what I believe, right? Did you say yeah, that? I, I get you. more help from the opposite, from the Republican. Now, I'm a Democrat, but I get more answers. When I call a Republican, they're going to call me back. When I call a Democrat, I got two or three that will call me back. That's not good. Well, see, here's my thing. I don't, you know, I think people have to vote in their own interest. And if voting for a Republican official is in your interest, I don't have any problem with that because I've, I've, um, I, I know Republicans and I've known some uh, Republicans that I actually agree with and I have voted for. Mm -hmm. So I'm a person uh, that believes in supporting the individual, not the party, because I think we, uh, sometimes vote blindly by not looking at the individual. But I think we need to get involved. We need to know what these people are saying. But you know, one of the things you said, Loretta, is about we are not monolithic. We're not uh, what? We are not, we're not monolithic, meaning that we um, don't all believe the same thing. Now, the, here's the thing. A lot of people might be surprised to know this that black people have never ever believed in one way as a group of people. I mean, in Dr. King's movement, and if you don't believe me, there's a book called uh, Part in the Waters written by Taylor Branch. There were people, black people, who couldn't stand the ground King walked on. Yeah, that is true. That's now, very true. There was a minister who didn't like King so much that after he passed, they named a street after Dr. Martin Luther King. It just so happened that the street faced the front entrance of the church. So you have to go on the street to get to his church. He put a new entrance on the side street, so you won't have to do that. It's a minister. He did what? He created, he carved out another entrance to his church. So you won't have to go down Martin Luther King Street to get in the front door of his church. It's in wow. Taylor Branch's book, Part of the Water. But, and then too, um, 
when you look at the civil rights movement, which was composed of a, a lot of different entities, you had Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. King's organization, which was basically comprised of uh, ministers. Then you had the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was basically surprised, comprised of young people who did a lot of the quote unquote dirty work down in uh, th these rural Southern towns. Goodman, Swerning, and Cheney, those three young people who were killed in Mississippi, they were members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Um, but there were never a lot of Black people involved in the movement. Then just what? Well, let me read these comments and then we're going to get back to that because, and, and if I forget what I was getting ready to say, just say Black Lives Matter. Somebody say that because I want to I want to get to a point. Uh, Minister Bobby Bridges said, yes, we do too much fighting against each other. Uh, Valvita Thomas said, this is why I learned to split my votes. Me too. Um, Minister Bobby Bridge said that's one of our biggest problems. Um, yep. Darren Thomas Thompson said we need to continue the legacy of Dr. King and help keep not just hope alive, but we need to get the information together to these pastors to help promote these things in the church and the community. Um, Don, this young man was agreeing with you. You're right, my brother. And uh, once again, another fantastic part. Thank you, Wayne. Now, what I was going to say, um, thank you, Katina, Black Lives Matter. We don't have a problem coming together if somebody get killed and get the mission done. But the same energy that's put towards that can be pushed towards start a, starting a voters right movement because the 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 older people a lot of the older people that was involved in the movement they're gone so what are we going to do what are we going to do are we going just going to sit back and we're going to let things be as they are or somebody going to step in and say hey you know, we had too many people not just Dr. King but too many other people that sacrificed for us and we won't even get up out in the bed and go vote and god forbid that it rain you know, and then Loretta, we're the first ones don who sit back and criticize well they ain't doing this they ain't doing that if you are a voter for a, a voter you can hold that politician accountable you know loretta one of the things i think about you look at people like me and you we're old enough to know what the movement was all about. Um, we're old enough to know the difficulties that uh, people had back in the day with respect to voting. Um, I think a lot of young people don't really know the struggles that was entailed to get people to vote. I mean, it, yeah, okay, yeah, you died for you. Yeah, okay, great. I can tell you that, but until you read it and really understand that yeah, people died. People actually did die. So you can go down to that poll and vote. That's why you can go down there because people died. And somehow I think sometimes that message has not resonated with a lot of our young people. And I think it's probably because I don't know if we as adults have done a good job in telling the story or Don, getting all young children to read. Don, mm -hmm. I, I need you to look up at this one because they go to Google for everything else. If they mm -hmm. wanted to know our history and our roots, they could go to Google and find out everything well, 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 yeah, that's that, cool. that they need to find out, but it don't interest them. But a lot of times they don't, it don't interest them because they don't know. I, you know, I, I um, have a grandson and when he was small, I used to, um, every Martin Luther King Day, we always went to an activity. And I would take him out, to, him and his friends, out to eat and tell them the story about why this day is so important. And I would tell them about, you know, hey, you know, I remember the times when I couldn't join the YMCA because I was Black. I remember that too. Mm -hmm. 
I remember the times when I was drinking out of white water fountain and my cousin had to pull me away from the fountain. Yes. Thought, um, they don't remember any of that, but I was I always told them that. And when I would talk to them, they would look like, what? I said, yeah, that actually happened. And uh, I'll never forget this one kid. I was telling, we were at Shawnee's restaurant and I was telling him, I said, you know, when I was your age, we couldn't come to a restaurant like that to eat. And he said, why? And so I went through that whole thing. Uh, you know what he asked me? What's that? Uh, why didn't y'all build your own restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> that was good thinking. That was good thinking. And I, I told him we did. Um, and perhaps we need more people who think like you. But I think sometimes, you know, these young people think they're so far removed because they're just out here trying to make it. But you got to realize the very principles on which you're trying to make it is going to be decided by somebody at that state house or in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. or whoever sits in the mayoral chair. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you can't complain if you don't get involved. You can't complain if you don't get involved. What is it going to take, Don? That's the last thing on not all young people, because some young people are very serious about voting, but they are. They depend, parents, some parents, not all parents, they depend on the Black History Month for the school to teach them. Well, the school is not going to teach them Black history. They're no. going to teach just enough to get away. If we want, just like we used to have family devotion, okay, we could have history lessons because we got inventors, we got, we got things that go on that when I go on um, YouTube or when I go on Google, I'm amazed at some of the things that I didn't even know. So I try to make it a point to learn something. And if Dr. King, you can say what you want to. I think if he was living, he'd be very disappointed. Well, he probably would. He would be, be disappointed. very disappointed, Don. Well, it's, it's, the pitch is not all that bleak. I mean, you got to hold out hope. I mean, you got to get them to understand that we are where we are now because of what went on before. I mean, it's, it's not a total lost cause. Well, let me ask you this then. Uh -huh. We proved, along with others, how much power we had during the George Floyd and, and what's that boy named that had the uh, Skittles and the tea? Uh, Trayvon Martin. And we, we proved the, the marches and everything proved that we have power. But what we tend to do is march, but we do nothing after the march. We don't come together. We don't have no meetings. We are march, 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 march. But we come together. We don't have any meetings. And some of these big people, you don't see and hear from them until they is a Trayvon Martin or George Floyd. That's the only time they come out of the woodwork. Well, what we need leadership other than during the time when somebody get killed. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I came up through the NAACP. And one of the things about coming up through the NAACP is it really teaches you that leadership thing about how to hold a march, what to expect, how do you plan it, what do you say, how do you issue a press release. When you get up to the state house, how do you prepare to deliver a presentation? And I always tell people. If I had a young child, I, I would put them in the uh, Columbia Branch in NAACP youth. I mean, because that's where you can learn leadership. And I think a lot of times our young people, I mean, you know, we march, Loretta, but it's all reactionary. Yeah, somebody gets killed by the police. Yeah, we're going to march. But are we going to get involved with city council or our state government to- That's what I'm talking about. To-, to uh, uh legislate bills that will stop these things from happening in the first place but see the problem is that's not excuse my language that's not sexy because it's behind the scenes you know you know nobody's seeing you out there i mean you you quietly doing things nobody knows what you're doing but it's important jim clavin told me a long time ago that um when i started working for him i mean like everything happened because this is my background man we need to have a press conference we need to have a press conference he said, no, you don't. 
because a lot of times people don't need to know what you're doing in the first place. And so uh, you, we have to get our young people to understand that you got to get engaged in the process. It's not just enough to be reactionary when someone gets killed. We we have to we have to um, put that wheel in motion before those things happen. What was the gentleman the gentleman that got shot in Louisiana? What was his name? Uh I know who he's talking about, but I am not sure. But you know what's interesting? You talk about voting. Ferguson, I think it was Ferguson, Missouri, and I forgot the man's name. Yes, yes, yes. That now, Brown that, guy, Michael Brown, right? Michael Brown. That yeah. town was maybe I don't know, fifty or sixty percent. It was majority black. But they were, but the police chief was white. The majority of police were white. Most of the people on city council was white. Now, how does that happen in a town that's seven over six or seventy percent black? That tells you right there that the African Americans there were not engaged in the process. But then this happened, and they want to come out and demonstrate for four or five days, which is fine. But the question is, did they get involved in the political? Evidently not to change that status quo. That's that's really the end of the question because if you had people who look like me or you in some of those roles, they can understand the sensitivity of police jacking people up and they will stop it. So it's very important. Well, let me ask you this, Don. Now we 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 supposed to be talking about Dr. King, but all this can tie into Dr. King. And I know you're gonna kind of hesitate. But I, I got to say it. We put some of us in office. But some of us won't do nothing to help us. You I got could name if I wanted to. Uh, if I, I wanted it. to. I, no, I'm not going to do it. But I could name the ones that will actually return your call. They won't even respond. They have secretaries. And they won't even have their secretary to respond by you. But when it's voting time, they want to come and do fish fries and hamburgers and hot dog. Well, I don't want your fish fry. Well, I, I don't want your hot dog if you can't call me during the time I need you. It's voting time where you have to hold them accountable. You well, to- I, I hold I hold mine accountable. Uh-huh. But what I'm saying, we get we have some people. Some elected officials that you never see until it's election time, and we allow them to come in our communities and 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 with that little cheap fish and and them little sodas and stuff. And it says, "Oh, they bought us fish." Yeah, they bought us fish. Now I know that's Ebonics. They bought us fish because they want us vote. But what do they do? The other four well, years, let me tell the you other two years. Let me tell you something. If I'm an elected official and I bought mac and cheese and whatever else we in the community and that's all it takes me to get your vote that's what i'm gonna bring every time well, I'm, not, I'm not with, blaming oh, them don i'm no, blaming no, no, us my point is, exactly and that's the point i'm making until we the people say look you know what i can get mac and cheese at home this ain't this not what it's about it's about what policies are you going to put in place to make this community a better place? But what I'm saying is, if they bring that to the community and that's all it takes, they're going to keep bringing it. I would. Now, of course, yeah. I, I mean, if I saw you, I, you know, I, no. But if you see fine. me, you better run because I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say, I, listen, I call you, I'm going to pick my phone up and say, I call you on such and such a date. Left a message. I call you again on such and such a day. Left a message. And God forbid if I go to a forum and they let me ask questions, I'm going to say, why can't I get a phone call back? And you, you're here tonight giving us hot dog, hamburger, and chicken. But you know what? But you know what, Loretta? I'm going to tell you something. I hear that all the time. I do. But they don't you do nothing. All, but then the people, unlike you who get involved, some people complain First of all, they don't go out to vote. Secondly, they don't go out to any meetings that take place in the community. There was um, a legislator in Greenville. I, you, you remember Joe Brown? Yes. 
Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. You don't find leadership like that every day. No, you don't. Now, but here's the thing. I was talking to Joe Brown one day, just one of the nicest persons you could mm -hmm. ever meet. Nice person. I was talking to him one day and we were talking. He said, you know what, Brother Frierson? I have these meetings throughout my little area I represent. And nobody shows up. They don't show up. And it's like you don't know because I would announce and he would pass our flyers and everything. Nobody shows up. So you know what? If they want collard greens, I'll bring them that because I'm having these meetings to discuss policy and they don't show up. So how are you going to call hold somebody accountable and you don't show up? It's really sad. And you know, they know that, that we, we ain't gonna do nothing but march and fuss. Well, we, no, no, not everybody, Don, uh -huh. but they know a percentage. We're gonna march and we're gonna, and we're gonna fuss. But when it comes down, hey, Miss Hopkins, when it comes down to meetings and taking care of business, we know where to be found. But marching has its place as well as meetings. Everything has its place. But, but you know, we have to get involved on many different levels. Sometimes we got to march. Sometimes we got to go to meetings. Sometimes we got to uh, go up to the state house. Sometimes we got to go to Washington. Sometimes we need to just have meetings in our own community because that's what we need to do. We need to just operate on, on different levels. It's almost like, what's that, my favorite verse in Ecclesiastes, to everything there's a season. There's a season to march. There's a season to go up to the state house. There's a season to uh, go to these meetings that these representatives hold. There's just a meeting to get involved. You know, we just got well, Let me say this. Um recognize what's going on out there. That's why, you know, doing getting back to Dr. King, there were a lot of people who criticized King. All they're doing is mocking. All they, you know, he ain't doing nothing. You know, I, I got to go to work and all that other stuff. But look what happened. Look what those marchers produced. Mm -hmm. And back then, they were doing more than just marching. I mean, they were risking their lives. Mm -hmm. The story, speaking, the story about 1964 Voting Rights Act and John Lewis crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you know that bridge in Selma, Alabama, that yes. they crossed and they yes. were beaten and it was on national TV. If you ever go down to uh, Alabama, Montgomery, you need to go across that bridge. You need to get out of your car and walk across the bridge. I did that. And you can almost feel what those people felt that night they were trying to cross that bridge but you know why that happened you know why they even had to march in the first place no tell me several several weeks before that there was a boy named jimmy lee jackson they were on the i think it was the NAAC or the student christian or uh, sclc they were on a night march which really was the most dangerous march you could have back then. And so the police came in, you know, those racist cops did down in Mississippi, did what they normally do, beat up people and all that. Well, one of them attacked a guy's mother named Jimmy Lee Jackson. Jimmy Lee Jackson stood up for his mother and the cops killed him. Mm. And as a result of that, it was decided that they needed to have a Voting Rights Act, a Voting Rights March in Selma, Alabama. So that's where the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge comes into play. Because in order to get from Selma to Montgomery, you got to cross the bridge. Mm -hmm. And so that is where that march came in because Jimmy Lee Jackson stood up for his mother and they killed him. But, you know, they were out there because they saw a need to get involved. I mean, we can get involved now. And you're not going to get, well, you're not going to get killed. Most times, you don't, the danger that they had to face through getting involved, we don't have to face. It. So not, we, with, not with marching, but we have to face it with one another. Yeah, but I mean, I'm. I'm ain't no but, Don. It's too, too much killing each other. True. 
That's very true. It's too much killing each other. Well, and it's not only that. Uh, When you look at the number of African-American men killing themselves, that's frightening too. Um, So these are, in a way, these are the best of times and these are the worst of times. Um, And I guess it's always going to be like that to a certain extent. But see, the problem is, Loretta, you got a lot of people don't realize how far we have come. I hear people say, oh, we ain't, we didn't achieve nothing. We, we ain't come that far. Adel Adams, who you knew, told me one time we were talking. I said, Adel, you know, we down here working at the NAACP. We be down here at two or three o'clock in the morning, which we were. And I said, you know, I still hear people say that, um, you know, we hadn't, we hadn't done anything or we have not, um, accomplished anything. And she said, you know what? No one should ever say that. Because if I tell you that we have never accomplished anything, then what was Dr. Martin Luther King about? Why are we even celebrating that? What was Emmett Till about? What was Jimmy Lee Jackson about? What did they die for? You mean what they died for didn't accomplish nothing? You can't say that. And I think a lot of times our young people don't realize how far we have come and relative to what we had is much better. Now, I mean, some people might not, ah, you crazy and all, but it is. It's much better. I remember now, I remember not even being able to go to the movie theater. We had to sit up in the top of the movie theater. I remember, I remember at the doctor's office, they had the white side and the black side. Yeah. I remember at the Dairy Maid where we had to order one one, then they had to order another one. Then. I remember all that. But I mean, not only that, but you couldn't get, if you were hired as a police officer, you had to stay in your community. Um, they were barely hiring black firefighters. You couldn't even, look here, my mother had a degree from uh, Allen University and her sister had a degree from Allen University. And they were very smart women. They couldn't get a job in state government unless it was mopping somebody's floor. But here I am. I got a job in state government right after I got out of high school. So we have made progress now to say that everything is fine and we can just go home and go to sleep. No, no. But you have to recognize how far we have come. And I think a lot of people uh, don't recognize that. They rather would sit back and, oh, we are here. But we have come a long way, and it hasn't been easy, and it's never going to be easy. You're always going to have to get out and fight. I agree with that, Don. Well, we need to do right what Miss Hopkins just said. We need to come back to the table with our children at breakfast, lunch, and dinner with conversations on Bible history and politics, and our children have become a lost generation because we have stopped talking and sharing the foundation of our roots. And I agree with that because that's true. Very few families eat together. This one eat in their room, that one eat in their room. Um, and we we too busy to sit down and have conversations with our kids. Don't wait to talk to them when there's when somebody's wrongfully killed, but talk to them about. You know, you got to be careful when you go here. You got to be careful when you go there. You, If you're doing what's right, then you have a right to speak. But you can't, if you're doing wrong, you can't expect to make wrong right. But Don, I, I, I want to ask you something. And maybe you can't say it because, you know, you're a, a popular talk show host. But wow. I'm going to ask you. Boy. Oh, you are. In your opinion... And if you don't want to answer it, I can answer it for you. But in your opinion, have we had a real leader since Dr. King? No, but let me let me um, say this. Maybe that has been our downfall in that we were looking for another Dr. King. Without realizing when Dr. King was around, there were, he now he was not the only one. You had Malcolm X, you had Whitney Young, you had uh, James Foreman with the SCLC, you had, um, who else? You had, um, who was the guy at the Urban League? I can't think of his name. 
Whitney Young, you had uh, Roy Wilkins. Matter of fact, they used to call them the big four, Dr. King, Whitney Young, Roy Wilkins, and James Foreman, of course. I think I got that right. They, they would call them the big four. Um, so it was not just only Dr. King who was out there. Now, the civil rights movement has come to be crystallized around Dr. King, and I think that's good because in studying his life, you also study what it took to for him to come out and do what he did because his story is the story of a lot of those civil rights leaders back during that time. Mm -hmm. He wasn't the only one. But then again, Loretta, you know, a lot of times I think we, we're looking for one leader and, and we're not going to find. I mean, look, everything you do in the community and people know what you do. You don't have to do that because, quite frankly, you could go home and lay down and go to sleep all day. Uh, play with your dogs or go sit out on the park bench somewhere. But you're always out there doing something. That's what a leader does. The question is, do we have more people like you as opposed to more people like Dr. King? Think about it. Well, yeah. I don't think that's that's no comparison. No, I don't think that, no, no, but I, no, I don't you know. think that's no comparison. Hold on, hold on. Let's read this. But to be honest, you don't need another Dr. King. He done what he had to do while he was here. We have to raise up leaders. And, and, and that's what I'm talking about. I'm not saying that for them to be like Dr. King, because nobody can be like another person. But who's going to step forth and say, I am here for you, young brother. I'm here for you, young sister. Believe it or not, believe it or not, Loretta. There are people out there who do that every day. Well, you have to tell me who they is. Well, I'm looking at one right now. <laughs> I mean, you can't. Oh, God. I mean, you know, you, you play yourself short, girl. But there are people like, I'm serious. That's What is a leader? A leader is someone who inspires someone to follow. I mean, look. No, well, I mean, one thing that the leaders do know, if uh -huh. I call on you during the off season and you don't help me and you don't even answer my call, I'm going to tell it during your election time. But, but see, the other thing is, and this is what Jim Oh, I'm going to tell it. I'm going to tell it. I understand, but the other thing is, people think that a leader has to be visible. A leader has No, they to... don't have to be no, visible. No, no, no. Let me finish. Let me finish. A leader has to be seen. Now, I'm, let me let me hold, let me tell you what I'm talking about. And this this actually happened when they were demonstrating in Charleston, South Carolina. And I go back to Jim because I, I learned a lot from Jim Clyburn. Uh, he told me that they were all locked up in jail, mm -hmm. and while they were locked up in jail they were talking about this individual, this black person, who they felt wasn't doing a thing in the community, just turned their backs on black people. He, you know, he was a man of means and all this. And so they talked about him during the whole time they were in jail. So ultimately, at some point, they were bailed out of jail. But what they didn't know is the same man who they talked about while they were in jail was the one who raised the bail money to get them out of jail. What I'm saying is you don't know what people are doing in their quiet way to provide leadership. I, Don, I don't, I, I don't disagree with that, Don. I don't disagree with that. No, but I don't know what you're doing half the time. And they wouldn't, I wouldn't know if you didn't just tell me but there are people just like you. You inspire people. Do something. That's what a leader does. It doesn't necessarily have to be one person talking at the Lincoln Memorial. It could be somebody talking um, down on Hampton Street or somebody talking uh, across the street from the State House, or somebody who just goes in the community and gets involved with kids. Um, or it could be Hakeem Jeffries, who rose up through the streets of Brooklyn, New York. Him and his brother taking a train, get to school every day. And if you've been to New York, 
for little kids to take a train to get to school every day and go back home, that is no, that is no simple task. But he was inspired by people. That's what leaders do. Leaders inspire people. God. Just like you, just like you were inspired by somebody, Loretta, you are inspiring somebody else. Don. Yes, it all. Let me read this first. You know who he talking about right here? Who well, King Jeffers? Yeah. Yeah, he's the uh, minority speaker of the House. He represents the Democrats. He is the first African American person to hold a leadership position in the United States House of Representatives. You, United States House of Representatives on that level. Okay, um, Ms. Hopkins said, no one who's developing the big four are leaders in the generation. We cannot be the past leaders. Their foundation begin at home. What happens to the homes? What happens to the home? In the homes is what she said. But let me, let me, let me say this. Let me say this. Let me clear up this. I don't believe a leader got to be on every corner every week. I don't believe that. Yeah. And you are absolutely right. You have some leaders that do stuff quietly. Don, I, we need to see your face. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, I, there are some leaders who do things quietly. But if you got a if you got a secretary, and you can't have that secretary to say, Mister Fryson call. Um, and he wanted ABC. Well, call Mr. Fryerson back and whatever the, whatever the question was and let him know. I let him know I won't be here, able to help him this time, uh, ABC. But you got secretaries and you still don't answer your people? Loretta, there have always been people on the face of this earth like that, even when Dr. King was around. There were people like that. They were. Look, I remember we would go to marches and... Um, you know, we would try to get various churches to coalesce and to come together to provide buses and stuff like that. Sometimes we would call a church. We couldn't get anybody. Can't hear you, Don. And then if we got somebody, oh, they went out. Out of it, they just, like, well, you know, I don't want to be associated with this church. Well, you've always had people like that. You know, and you and a hundred years from now, you're gonna have people like that who are in office, you call and they aren't gonna call you back. Well, I do know that, uh -huh. but I'm saying I think everybody deserves a response. Now, listen to me, Don. Uh -huh. It's not all about you giving. Okay, let me let me let me give a perfect example, and I'm not gonna call his name. I'm not gonna call his name. Um, this Martin Luther King event that I'm having Monday, I sent a lot of letters out for financial support for it. Um, a person responded back to me last night and they said, I am out of town, so I won't be able to help you, but I wish your event goes well. That, I, I inboxed them back and I said, this is priceless to me because I have sent letters, called left message to some of our hometown politicians here and they wouldn't even respond. If you can't do it, if you can't make a donation, you can't do it. It's nobody's gonna have anything against you because you say no. But I think everybody deserves a response. You know what, Loretta? I'm gonna tell you something. No, you can't tell me nothing about that. Yeah, no, I can tell you this though. Um, there have always been those situations where people have tried to do something. And they ran into stumbling blocks either because people didn't believe in them or thought what they were doing was crazy. Dr. Martin Luther King is a prime example of that. I mean, he was. He never had, he never had the majority of black people behind him because some people thought he was crazy. The question is, when you meet up with situations like that, then what do you do? You just move they ain't on. They're gonna get my vote the next go round. Right. Exactly. They're not going to get my vote because if you can't just have your secretary to send me a one line, of, I'm sorry, I will not be able to help you this time. I'm not going to get upset because you couldn't help me. But Don, you said, son, you said not everybody, you know, <laughs> I see you, I see you, Carrie, uh, Gary, but I didn't know. Let me, let me explain you what I meant, Gary. 
yes, his cash out work, but his response meant so much to me because I was ignored by so many other politicians. And just to hear him, you know, he on vacation, but he took time to respond back. That was priceless to me. That was priceless to me. And it's not the big things, it's a little thing. But Don, you want me to tell you something? I'm listening. Now, for this Martin Luther King, we celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King Monday, right? Uh-huh. You know who the majority of my sponsors was? Who? Oh. White people. Well, I mean, but it doesn't matter. As long as- Yeah, it does matter. No, no, Yes, no. it does no, matter. I'm why it don't matter. Huh? I'm gonna tell you why it don't matter in the long run, because you're trying to achieve a goal. You're trying to achieve an objective. Whoever goes along with you for the ride, then fine. You can realize that goal or objective. Because a lot of times your people just ain't gonna be there for you. They wasn't there. A lot of them wasn't there with Dr. King. Um, you know. Wherever you get the resources to do what you got to do, then you got to take it and you got to ride on with it. Because the fact of the matter is, and this is true down through history, most of the things that got us to where we are have not been accomplished by the masses of people. I mean, look, Jesus just only had 12 disciples. He didn't have 100 disciples. How many people... Do you think he asked you, hey, come on, go with me. Uh, just, you know, I follow me. Follow. How many people you think turned them down? I bet. <laughs> <it was, laughs> Don, it's not about, you missing the point. It's no, not I'm about not them saying no. I don't mind being told no. Uh -huh. I would like for them to say yes, but I don't mind being told no. Just don't ignore me. Like well, What I'm saying is the people ignored Jesus too, and he went on and found somebody else. Well, Jesus was Jesus. I ain't Jesus. No, but Jesus, <laughs> Jesus left Jesus was with, Jesus. I ain't Jesus. Jesus left up with a story and a and a, uh, and a morality to follow. I mean, I, you know, it, it's, it's difficult when you're planning something and people just don't get on board, and you realize the struggle that people had during the civil rights movement. Uh, people who um, struggled to get. I mean, in Birmingham, Alabama. When Dr. King was trying to mobilize the adults to get involved in the movement in Birmingham, Alabama, which was called Bombingham, Alabama, because just about every house on every street was getting bombed by white racists, they couldn't get the adults to go along because they were afraid. You know what they did? A guy named James Bevel said, okay, we'll get your kids. And that's what they did. They got the young people. They okay, fine. We'll go, we'll go find somebody else, and that's what they did. You you're not hearing what I'm saying. Yes, I am. What? Well, tell me, what are you saying? You're not <laughs> here. I you talking about? I'm just simply saying a, a response, a simple uh -huh. response. Right. Everybody deserves a response. True. I don't expect a senator a House of Representative, a Congressman, the President, um, even City Council. I don't expect to hear from them one-on-one, -on -one, but you got secretaries. All you got to do, you get the email, the email come to your telephone, transfer it to your secretary and tell her what to say. Come on, Don. That's what they do when they want to vote. Okay, so Loretta, you don't get a response. Now what? I ain't gonna vote for him next time. Oh, there you go. And then I'm gonna tell him why. That's it. That's what you're supposed to do. I'm gonna tell him why. I'm gonna you say, know. you know, you could you could respond back to me. And I think that's what we have to do. If my vote is good enough for you, then I deserve a response. But you know what you know what that is called, Loretta? That is called holding people accountable. Oh yeah. That's what you gotta do. But then you hold people accountable and then you move on. Because that's all you can do is hold them accountable. Whatever you do, you don't let them stop no show. Because one month, well, I, they ain't gonna stop me. But right. I guarantee you, I got the emails that I can prove. They say, "Well, you ain't called me." Oh, yes, I did. And he say, "Open." It say, "Open." He'll let you know when they open it. You gotta hold them accountable. And see, nothing 
gets me any more than a person that ignore me. I've had no's all my life. People to tell me, no, that don't bother me. But just to ignore it, like what you doing don't matter. You know what, Loretta? Some of our greatest inventions, some of our greatest books have been published as a result of the perseverance of people who have been told no. Don't even get a call back. Um, Harry Potter. Now, I'm using this as an example. I don't know how many times J.K. Rollins was turned down. She was told no. Some people wouldn't call her back. Some people uh, wouldn't even listen to her. But through persistence, she found that one person who did listen, who did call her back. Now both of them rich. Marvin Gaye's uh, What's Going On by um, Marvin Gaye thought that would be a great record. Barry Gordon did not want to release it. Barry, um, Barry Gordon told him no. Wouldn't take his phone call. Uh, there had to be an uproar inside of Motown for that record to be released. Now, when it was released, Barry Gordon beat a path to Marvin Gaye's door and said, oh, well, hey, look, you know, um, you got to, uh, we, we got to come out with an album. And they did. And it was called What's Going On, one of the best albums ever recorded. But some of the greatest things that ever happened, happened because somebody was told no or somebody didn't get a return phone call. I feel you and I understand you. Awesome. But I still say everybody deserves a response, even if it's a no. But you know, the thing about it is that is true. But just because you deserve it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get it. Because some people are just like that. They're just like that. They think it's all about them. They ain't, they ain't got to call you. They They just think, hey, you know, I'm here. And you, they're just people like that in the world. And anytime you try to do something, you're going to run across people like that. I mean, you know, you're just going to run across people like that. And the thing about it is you got to hold them accountable and keep on pushing. Ms. Hopkins said, I agree with him. It is the purpose and not the name or race. You got your program established. The question is, how many no titles support you? It's when people that you, it's when people see that you accomplished what you started out to do and it manifested, proves the title meant nothing. Huh. But that's the story of the civil rights movement. I mean, how many King times was Dr. King told no about it? No, Dr. you can't do this, you can't do that. There were people who could not stand the ground he walked on. Don't come in my church. I don't even want to see you on my block. No, I'm not going to give you a call back. He was told that. I mean, he wouldn't be told that now because, the, because we celebrate Dr. King now. We look back on him and celebrate what he's done. But you know that old saying, a prophet is without honor in his own land? Or yes, Lord. <laughs> and I told, I, I wrote a note on my Facebook page to all leaders in South Carolina. When I win the billion dollar, a million dollar lottery, I don't want no kind of award from your organization. Because the same thing I will be doing then is what I do now. And I don't get it because I, they say I don't have nothing to bring to the table. You know, I think... Um, now, one, you think I'm wrong for that, don't you? No, I'm going to say this. You know, one of the things about the civil rights movement is, and I, I think about this a lot, um, even going back to the um, 19th century, the 1800s, when Africans were on the uh, plantations and they were just fighting so desperately to get off the plantation, they couldn't read. And when they finally were emancipated, they went looking for their own children or their own family members and the, the things that they fought for. And the 
you think about it, they knew that they were not going to live long enough to see the things that they were fighting for. But they fought for them anyway. Um, they fought for us to get the right to vote. But a lot of those people had been had died by the time Obama was elected. They never saw it. Hakeem Jeffries, the first African American to serve as a minority speaker, he'll be the majority in two years. He got there because of the vote and because people were involved politically. But a lot of those people who were involved, they never lived to see that. They never lived to see that. Well, I'm going to ask you another question. Monday is a holiday, mm -hmm. Dr. King, in honor of Dr. King. How many How many people you think will actually, um, I'm not talking about my concert now, but there are going to be events all over. How many people you think will actually celebrate in some kind of way in his honor? Or is it just going to be another day? It's going to be another day for a whole lot of people. It's going to, I mean, just be real. It's going to be another day for a whole lot of people. Another day to take off, not do anything. But that that's how it was during the Civil Rights Movement. For a lot of people, it's just another day. Don, sometimes it seems like we, we've come a long way, but sometimes it seems like we're going backwards. Well, you know, you got to look at it. Okay, is the, is the glass half full or is it half empty? I rather take the um, positive view that it's half full because we have come a long way. The question is, are we satisfied with where we are now? Do we think that, okay, on Monday we'll get up and all we're going to hear is that I have a dream speech. And do we think that we have a ride there so we can sit back and just relax and not get involved. Now, you and I know that's not the case. But what do the majority of us think? A lot of us don't even really know a whole lot about Dr. King. And I, you know, other than well, that. We don't know nothing else, but he fought for our rights, not just for African Americans, but for anybody who was treated in injustice. And we know that he was murdered at a Lorraine Hotel. We know he was a pastor of New Ebenezer Baptist Church. He was married to Coretta King. They had four children. We know that. But we also know he spoke at the Lincoln Memorial. He said, I have a dream. That's about the only speech we can think of. Maybe it's all, all they got to do is go to YouTube. That's what I did when I've been promoting this event that I'm going to do Monday. I've been using different speeches. And, and in, in addition to that, it helped me to learn because I just found out. And when Congressman Clyburn was on my show is when he sparked my attention. He said he was a tiny man with a lot of power. Now, me looking at the pitch, Dr. King, I didn't, I didn't know he was a little short man. Uh -huh. I didn't know that. I was, I, and so when I was doing my research, then I found pictures. He was a little short, bitty thing. Yeah, you know what else he was? He, what? was, a, he was a pool shark too. Huh? He was a pool shark. He was very good at pool. 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 You know, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you and know, then you mentioned Mahalia Jackson. Mahalia Jackson was standing behind him right. because she was saying at a lot. That's why I'm doing this gospel musical because he loved gospel music. She would open up at a lot of his speeches singing gospel music. Right. Um, you know, you mentioned Congressman Clive, and I'll get to this story. He told me that Dr. King, before he died, came to Charleston. And you're talking about people being involved in the movement and all that. I was told that all the so-called big wigs found it convenient to be out of town when Dr. King came. Because now this was after he given his uh, Riverside his speech at Riverside Church, and he came out against the Vietnam War. And a lot of civil rights people turned on him, and. So he came to Charleston and all the big people found it convenient to be out of town. So uh, <laughs> what happened was, and there was a lot of tension in the air. As a matter of fact, there's a picture of Dr. King, Jim Clyburn, and Herbert Fielding 
on stage. And if you look at it, it looks as if they are ducking. Because what happened, a light bulb burst, and they thought that somebody had actually shot in the church. But Dr. King gave a speech. But the thing is, after Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated, and they decided to hold a memorial in the church, all those people who ran out of town when he was there alive came back. I mean... So you have a lot of people today who talked about they marched with Dr. King, they did that with Dr. King, and all this and all that, and, and they were no way around. Read and, that, Don. Uh-huh. Read that. I would hope my brother here will have some type of event one day to educate the youth. He appears to have a lot of knowledge. Pass that on. That's what it's like. I try to do that on the urban scene. Um, I try to do that with uh, young people. Um, but it's all, I, you know, I would encourage people to get a book by Taylor Branch. It's Taylor one, who? Taylor Branch. Branch? Yeah. Taylor, okay. T-A-Y-L-O-R-B-R-A-N-C-H. Mm. One book is called Parting the Water. The second companion to that is called uh pillars of fire or something like that and i can't remember what the third one is but it provides an excellent look into the civil rights movement and the life of dr martin luther king not only the life of dr martin luther king but what other people were doing also because mm -hmm. there were other people and one of the interesting things he he brought out in that book the first one um taylor branch um part in the water now, when we talk about the Mus Montgomery bus boycott, we think of Rosa Parks, right? Mm -hmm. Now, they paint a picture of Rosa Parks as being this mild old meat lady who was on the bus one day and she was tired and they asked her to move and she said she, was too she wasn't she was going to move and all that. But what a lot of people don't know is Rosa Parks was a freedom fighter. Rosa Parks wasn't no quiet, meek person. As a matter of fact, there was a young girl named Claudine, I forgot what her last name is. About a month before Rosa Parks refused to get off the bus, she refused to get off the bus. But she wasn't acknowledged. She was not acknowledged because back during that time, she was dark skinned and she was pregnant. And they thought that it would be, she would not be the kind of person they would like to hold up as a symbol to the movement. But the interesting thing about her, she had come out of one of Rosa Parks NAACP youth meetings. So um, when Rosa Parks refused to get off the bus, you had E.D. Nixon and uh, Dr. King, and they got him because he was the newest pastor in town. Um, if he had been somewhere else, he never would have been who we know now. So they got him to be the lead person because he was a pastor of this big church and his money wasn't coming from nobody but the congregation. But the people who really made that Montgomery bus boycott go were black women. If it hadn't been for black women getting behind that, Dr. King never would have been known. They're the ones who went out there that night that, that Rosa Parks got kicked off the bus and started memorographing those flyers, passing them around. They're the ones who organized that thing. Hmm. So when you tell the story of Dr. King and, you know, you got, there were a lot of other people too. As a matter of fact, Septima Clark, who ran the uh, Highland School, she was a civil rights leader. She accompanied Dr. King uh, to when he went to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. She lived in Charleston. So I was working in Charleston and I thought it would be a good idea to call Miss Clark up to go around to her house and talk to her. So I called up, she said, sure, young man, come by, come on, you know. She didn't live that far from the radio station. So I went over to her house and she said, come in, just have a seat, I'm on the phone. Loretta, I waited 30 minutes and she finally came to, um, greet me and we sat down and talked. She said, young man, I want to apologize for being on the phone so long. 
But I was talking with uh, Rosa Parks, and you know, we just had something to talk about. I'm like, you know what? You could have stayed on the phone. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's a true story. That is a true story. But I mean, the, the place of black women in the movement. Uh, yeah. Matter of fact, you hear a lot of talk about the Black Panthers. 60 to 70 percent of the Black Panthers were comprised of black women. Really? Yeah. You can look it up. Mm -hmm. Most of them were black women. That's, that's a true fact. So, Don, we've been on here an hour and 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. You are a scholar. No, I uh, well, well, that's how I see you. And you got a lot of knowledge, like the man said. Encourage us to do something on Monday. If it's nothing but to tell a child or to um, a young person that may not know why we're celebrating a holiday. All these people that's on can put something on their Facebook page. Or uh, did you know? Or uh, did you know something about Dr. King? You know what, Loretta? I would encourage people because see, all everything is going on in a way as a facet of the movement. What you are doing with your gospel program is very important because if it wasn't for the black church and uh, gospel music, there wouldn't be any marches. So that, that, that was a very important aspect of what this is all about. So what you're doing is a very important element of what the movement was all about. Parents need to explain that to their children. They need to go and not only listen to the music, but explain why that was such an important component of the movement. They need to participate in the, mark, the NAACP march. Red Friend is going to be speaking Saturday at Central Baptist Church in addition. There are a lot of things going on. If you don't want to do nothing else but take your child to the Richmond County Public Library and let them check out a book on the civil rights movement of Dr. Martin Luther King, do that. Or better yet, tell them your stories about when you were coming up. What Congressman Clyburn is going to be at Brooklyn Baptist with a breakfast Saturday morning as well. Right. Go here, here. He has a lot. He'll have a lot to say and a lot to tell. But we need to talk to our kids. My talk to our kids. My grandmother used to talk to me about stories that have been passed down about how they used to, her ancestors used to run off the slave plantation and go down to the bush harbor to worship. And I had no idea what she was talking about. But years later, when I started reading about that stuff, it came back to me. So we just need to tell our kids the story. We need to learn the story, too, those of us who don't know. Well, we want to thank you for coming on because I couldn't have put it, put it like you did. Um, and I hope you come out. If you come out Monday, let me know, and I have your name at the door. But um, um, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your knowledge. I want to thank you for answering the call. Um, I want to thank you for everything that you pulled into us. I think it's been, what, over 40, 50 years on the urban scene? 35. 35? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I want to thank you for that. And uh, you continue to do what you're doing. And for you to be on here tonight meant a lot to me. And I appreciate you, um, you know, taking time to be on my show. I will honor this time that I had with you. Well, it's an honor to be here with you. And uh, I can't let you go without saying all of the wonderful things that you do in the community. Because actually, they're just as important as anything that I do or have ever done. Well... To God be the glory. That's all I got to say. That's about it. That's all you can say, right? <laughs> okay. Well, everybody, thank you so much. Um, this coming Monday, I will not be here live, but I will be live at the Dr. Martin Luther King Gospel Musical. I will come live every now and then, and I will be talking to you all from the concert, but I will be back live on Tuesday. But we want to thank you so very much for your support. And remember, share Dr. King with somebody this Sunday on his birthday and Monday on the holiday. And me, I appreciate you so much. Let me ask you a quick question. Where is that? Where, where is the program going to be held? It's at the Bethlehem Baptist Church Family Life Center of North Maine. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Thank you so very much. Thank you.